the only, the hero of the Republican Party, Mr. Ronald Reagan. Um, definitely one of the more transformative um, presidents in American history. So let's go ahead and get him started here. Um, Ronald Reagan, R, of course, Republican. Years in office, elected in 1980. Um, serves two terms. He was a California governor, used to be actor, actually was interviewed by Hueck, kind of interesting, as part of um, um, the investigation into um, the screenwriter situation um, in Hollywood um, during the 1950s. He is going to be um, known as the great communicator. He is definitely 100% one of the most interesting personalities to ever um, live in the White House, and one of the most beloved presidents as well. Um, good, bad, he is definitely um, up for debate. So um, the essential question we're looking at, to what extent did the two-term presidency of Ronald Reagan amount to a revolution? There's massive change, massive change. Um, we'll be reading a couple speeches looking at this. Reagan wants to really change how government works and lower um, the decisions to the people instead of having the federal government um, take and do everything. Um, he's definitely an old anti-federalist, if you will. Now, the first thing you've got to look at is neoconservatism. So kind of listen to me on this one, and then you can take it down. Neoconservatism. Um, the one thing I would definitely say is it's a, and you might want to put this, and you can shorten it if you want to, a rejection of the counterculture of the 60s. In other words, a rejection of hippies. Um, during the 60s and the early 70s, um, you really have that big push of a liberal counterculture movement, anti-Vietnam, make love, not war, all kinds of stuff like that. Your silent majority that um, actually Nixon had campaigned to is going to kind of evolve into this neoconservative group often referred to, and you can just put sometimes called the new quote right. Now, what I want to also look at here, and I'm going to go ahead and say if you want to under neoconservatives, you can pause this and put these three red things in as bullet points, if you wouldn't mind. So pause, and then I'll talk about them. Pause. All right. So a neoconservative um, is going to be focusing on the free enterprise capitalistic approach to the economy, not the FDR, the economy um, will be run by the government, and the government will spend all the money. Um, a neoconservative also likes a balanced budget. I want you to underline that, balanced budget. They don't want to spend too much, and they want to keep taxes low and lower taxes. Big old under arrow right there and a happy face for a lot of people because they don't like taxes. Um, but in the essence, the big goal of a neoconservative is, and this is what I want you to circle here, they wanted a smaller government. They want less social welfare, so that great society, that New Deal, all that stuff like that. A neoconservative says, that's nice, you want to help, but it's not the government's job to help the people. It's the people's job to help the people. The one thing a neoconservative will say it is the government's job to do is to have a strong military, though. Protection of the people is what is important. They also want to return to family values. Now, one thing I will tell you, family values in the 1980s is going to be considered these four things. Prayer in school, balanced budget, death penalty for criminals. You know, conservatives don't screw around. That's why in Texas, you know, don't break into somebody's house. They'll have a gun or six. Um, they also are very against homosexuality and pornography. Remember, this is the 1980s. It's not this time period. Um, and conservative means traditional. Um, the next thing we're going to take a look at, and you might want to just kind of listen for a second and kind of write as you listen if you want to. The neoconservative movement is going to have something called the moral majority, a conservative movement that was led by, and I do kind of want to make you write this right here, the evangelist Jerry Falwell, his moral majority. Now, they will, and you can just put a tax, equal rights amendment. How else do we refer to the equal rights amendment for women? Some of people call it the E. R A, so you could shorten that. They also lead an attack on abortion. Of course, the court case, you should know this one from last time, Roe versus Wade, very liberal ideal, um, uh, the right to um, choose. And they also will lead an attack on school busing programs, pornography, and social welfare. Again, a lot of your great society style social programs. And, you know, pornography, who isn't against that? So with that you have a definite um, conservative base with this Jerry Falwell's moral majority. In fact, I would even kind of compare Jerry Falwell's moral majority to about 30 years ago, 1980s to 1950s. Um, you had a very conservative movement after World War II when you had a television evangelist coming out by the name of Billy... 
Graham. Maybe you remember him. Very similar in nature. Now, the next thing I want to take a look at, mm, we'll get to the Heritage Foundation. There it is, um, is the Heritage Foundation. Now, I want you out beside Heritage Foundation. Will you put political? Now, the difference between the Heritage Foundation and the Moral Majority, Moral Majority was led by an evangelist. It's a little bit more religious. Um, the Heritage Foundation, and you hear that word heritage, it's tradition, um, promotes conservative public policies, limited government, and you can short government, GOVT, individual freedom, and of course, there it is, a strong national defense. Very, very similar there. Um, there are going to be a lot of conservatives in the 1980s popping up. Um, Phyllis Schlafly, and we've kind of already talked about her. She was a female. She was an outspoken um, opponent of the ERA, a radical feminist movement, and she actually is more of... Well, going back to the very beginning of American history, she's kind of a Republican motherhood where the mother's job is to foster good children in a family environment, good citizens. And basically, she will campaign against the ERA. She joins a group or starts a group, I'm sorry, called Join the ERA and writes a book called A Voice or I'm sorry, A Choice, Not an Echo. So she says, if you're against the ERA, you should be able to say it. She really believes that the 14th Amendment, citizenship, equality of protection, that kind of stuff, is enough for her and that women shouldn't have to um, be in the workforce if they don't want to. That traditional role is always reserved for them and it protects the family. Remember, heritage, traditional, moral, conservative. Okay, now the next one, you guys know this. NRA, what's it stand for? National Rifle Association. Ew, you are in Texas, you probably know this. And of course, make sure you put advocate Second Amendment. Uh, this is definitely a conservative base um, NRA. And again, we live in Texas. I don't think we need to talk about it too much. Okay. So Reagan's revolution landslide. Here is the electoral map. You literally have the question. He asks, and remember, he's the great communicator. He says to the people in 1980, when Carter has been ruling for about four years and things are not going, Iran hostage crisis, um, stagflation, not going very well. Congratulations on the Camp David Accords, but really it kind of is stinking in 1980. 80, poor Carter. And Reagan asks, are you better off today than you were four years ago? 90% of the electoral vote and 50%, more than half of the people in this country say, Reagan, no, we're not better off than we are four years ago. He is the great communicator. He says, I will fix it and I will put more responsibility on people. Government is the problem and is not the solution to the problem. So he definitely does take and he changes the role of government, domestic policy. Now, the next thing you have here is limiting the role of government. I just, I really want you to get down. This is the biggest thing right here. And I'm going to go ahead and say that it all needs to be read pretty much right here. Um, reduces government restrictions or regulations in favor of business productivity. Um, that is super important. Bullet point that. Now remember, a restriction or a regulation is a rule. Um, going back all the way back to, oh man, this is going to take a little bit of a brain power. Go back to Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, progressive, actually a Republican as well. Um, and he is going to say, you know, that the monopolies are taking over. He because becomes a trust buster. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt says, I'm done with this laissez-faire. We need regulation. And from Teddy, you, of course, then had FDR. FDR basically controls the economy during the Great Depression in hopes of fixing it. And also you have the World War II. And then after that, you have, you know, Truman's Fair Deal. Then you have, of course, LBJ's Great Society. And with that, it keeps imposing more and more either government restrictions or social welfare. What? Reagan and the conservative movement of the 1980s is about is about reducing the size of government and that means restrictions liberty freedom is no rules for a lot of the times and the more rules or restrictions you have the less freedom you have and so Reagan and many of his political um, alliances are going to not want government restrictions. Um, some of the examples of it, and you can write this, you don't have to write it, might be a good idea, is he reduced government restrictions on air pollution, fuel efficiency, wilderness, endangered species, and the stock market. Basically, EPA starts to go away. OSHA, that's a workers um, kind of an organization, takes that out. It's basically a union. The SEC, that's what's right behind there, SEC right there, um, that's the stock market. That came around in the New Deal. He takes regulations out of them and lets business do what business needs to be productive. Ooh, that sounds awfully familiar. Reagan's saying, let it be. Oh, that, wait, what? I think I have a word 
Do I have a word for this? Oh, I think it is. It's a French word. Let it be. Laissez faire. Another thing, and you want to write that, by the way. Um, Reagan took a very, and you can just put strong anti-labor stance because you got to think about it. Labor unions, in particular, anti-labor union stance. Maybe you want to write that in there. Um, is going to be back in the Gilded Age. You know, labor unions were like, "Hey, we should be getting paid the right amount of money to where we could have a life, work to live, not live to work." Right? Um, Gompers. And then, literally, um, the other thing is, is they're like, "Hey, we'd like to keep all of our limbs with you know the safety." So. Unions in the beginning were an amazing thing. They fought for those workers. As they've grown, sometimes unions have started to dominate businesses' agendas, and sometimes their budgets with demands for higher salaries, all these benefits, etc., all this stuff, pensions, etc. And so Reagan says for business to be productive, you have to let the business run the business, not the union run the business. So sometimes seen as anti labor. Now, ooh, let's talk about this. In fact, I want you to pause this right now. You better pause it and get down Reaganomics, the definition of Reaganomics, otherwise known as, a little bit more fancy, supply-side economics. Pause. All right, now Reagan blames the 1970s stagflation on government spending and high taxes. He, he doesn't always talk about the oil, although I think that's part of it. But he says government spending has been on the loose. So what he does is he devises an economic plan. The technical term for this is supply-side economics. We will, history will call it Reaganomics. Now, Reaganomics, if you look at the definition here, the number one thing I need you to circle is it's a 25% tax cut over three years. His idea here is that if I cut your taxes, I'm the government, if I cut your taxes, now you have more money. If you have more money, what are you going to do with it? You're going to spend it. You're going to spend it in the economy. You're going to boost the economy. Goodbye, stagflation. So he says that's going to be the first thing, 25% tax cut. Now, is that a lot? Whew, it is a lot of money you're talking about there. So he says if the government's going to have less money, 25% less money, okay, then we're going to have to spend less money. That's a simple budget, yes? So the second thing I need you to circle is decrease government spending by $41 billion. To end Keynesian economic spending, deficit spending, which is what FDR kind of believed in, if you need the economy to pick up, the government needs to spend money. Reagan says no. If you need the economy to pick up, you need to cut taxes so the people can spend money. So there's a definite difference there. Now to do this, he is really going to have to decrease spending. Now the one thing, spoiler alert, okay, sorry, I love Reagan and I love his personality, but the one thing Reagan doesn't do, he doesn't cut spending at all. Really, he kind of spends more. So it's a little bit of a problem in the fact that now we cut taxes and we're spending more, which creates, dum dum dum, four letter word, debt. We run a deficit. Now there are three laws you need to know about. Are you ready to get them down? I've already written them on your paper. Economic Recovery Act of 1981. Very simple. Just put largest largest tax cut in history. That is that 25% tax cut over three years. And you'll notice right here, they cut 5% in 81, 10% in 82, and 10% in 83. So that one's important. That's going to be your tax cut. And the next one we're going to look at is the Omnibus Reconciliation Act of 81 as well. Now this says a lot of things. Cut social services like food stamps, urban mastery, and student loans in the arts. Let me tell you, if you know your history, you can boil down all of this junk right here into cut what? What is that? Food stamps, urban mass transit, student loans, and the arts. That sounds awfully familiar to me. That sounds like I'm going to feed people, I'm going to give people ability to end poverty, I'm going to educate the kids, especially the lower income, and then I'm going to feed my brain to create a great society. You want to shorten that? Put cut great society programs. That's all it was, okay? Less social spending, but remember Reagan spends more on military. Actually, $2 trillion more. Dang, that sucks. Okay, so that little whole decreased government spending, not a good idea in the middle of the Cold War. You want big picture gains of economics, Reaganomics, inflation and unemployment decline, 6 million new jobs, but here's the deal. Huge federal deficits. If you're debt, eventually, someday, you're going to have to pay for it. So if you can fit that in, that's great. You can put a little bubble somewhere. 